Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this NetWealth Practice Management webinar. My name's Liam and I'm part of the marketing team here at NetWealth and I am delighted to be joined today by Anna Hacker from Australian Unity. Anna will be sharing the essentials of offering estate planning in your business, but before she gets stuck in, I will just run through some housekeeping items with you. So as always, this uh, webinar is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording in an email within a week of, the, of this presentation being finished. Um, over the course of today's presentation, feel free to enter any questions you would like to ask Anna in the little um, toolbar to the right of your screen. Anna will be an trying to answer any relevant questions throughout uh, the session, so feel free to enter them at any time and we'll say some for the very end as well. If you're on social media, and you'd like to post about, about the activities today, please make sure to include hashtag NetWealthInvest or tag us at NetWealthInvest. And this presentation is allocated one CPD point, um, a, a survey link to um, I get those CPD points will be included in the email with the webinar recording and uh, we'll repeat that that will be sent out within a week of this presentation concluding. So to introduce today's speaker, we have Anna Hacker, who is an accredited specialist in wills and estates and is currently the national manager of estate planning at Australian Unity Trustees Legal Services. She has previously worked in private practice in the fields of elder law and estate litigation and more recently in the trustee company industry, where the focus at Australian Unity Trustees is on assisting clients to protect their wealth and themselves during their lifetime and into the future by putting documents and structures in place to affect their lives. So I won't take up any more of your time. I'll let Anna get stuck right into it. Thank you for joining us, Anna. Thanks, Liam. What a great introduction. And it's um, covered off my first slide too. Um, I will just very quickly um, further to that introduction. So my background is in elder law. Um, so assisting people where there might be issues of elder abuse, um, challenges to estates, and dealing with protecting people so hopefully they won't be subject to elder abuse. And I find this, this concept of that transfer of trust really important because I think, and, and many of you out there might have already experienced this, that it is really vital to ensure that that trust is transferred from um, your existing clients to that next generation because unfortunately otherwise if your clients lose capacity or if they pass away, as unfortunately we all do, um, you, you may lose that client and you lose um, the ability to assist the further generations with um, their own um, wealth accumulation and their um, financial planning needs. So the, my team, um, we deal almost exclusively with referrals from financial advisors. So I hope that what this presentation is going to show you is, is some practical tips. Um, I, I will say that this is general advice only. Um, as a lawyer, you would expect that I would have had my nice disclaimer at the start, but somehow I have forgotten to put it in. So um, before this is sent out, I'll send one quickly through to Liam, you know, as a good lawyer, I always should. The learning outcomes. Um, I don't really like to give an agenda because I'm hoping that there will be some questions um, from the from from all of you listening to to guide some of the discussion. But what I'm hoping that you will get out of what I have planned is at the end be able to introduce the estate planning conversation into your advice conversation. Allow your clients who might say as as you know, well, I'm not going to do a will or I don't need to worry about this because my estate isn't really valuable. It's not very big. I don't see a need to have um, a, a complicated will in place. I'll just get that will kit. Be able to connect those dots and explain to them why they need it. And also, I think that this is really important, this last point. Identify possible cases of elder law issues and potential elder law abuse. And the reason I say this is important is because it's not just about protecting them as your clients. This is also, I think, something that we will see as a big issue in the future, and you will see from the case studies um, in other countries, there's already been criminal um, litigation in relation to wealth managers um, in respect of their work with clients who potentially are already subject to elder abuse. Um, I, I would also suggest that even though I haven't seen it come up as far as the Royal Commission goes, the Law Institute here in Victoria has raised it as one of the things they suggest the Royal Commission should look at. 
So even if it is not looked at at this time, it is certainly on the radars of lawyers. And if it's on the radars of lawyers, I can assure you that is because we are seeing these issues come out. The fact that the Law Institute chose to um, release a statement saying they think it's, it should be an area that the Commission looks at, I would suggest means that's because there are reasons, that there's cases that are happening right now. I think that as well at the end of this, you should be able to understand how that conversation about estate planning add value, adds value to your own relationships with your clients. And the reason it adds value is because you're not just talking about um, you know, the, the, the estate, the financial planning um, aspects, but you're deep, deeping, you're delving deeper into the ways that your clients relate to their families. And that's the, I guess, they'll see a lot of value in that. Also the ways that estate planning can be effective in that intergenerational transfer of your client's trust. So the wealth is one thing, the ability to ensure that you assist your client's children, but the other part is that trust, because without the trust, we all know that clients won't stick around for long. Um, as well, even though I will say, and you'll probably be sick of hearing it by the end of this, that um, you know I'm a lawyer, I provide legal advice, you're a financial advisor, you provide financial advice, there's not really um, a lot that we should do in the other er person's area. However, you do need to understand some of the general structures and what, when you say you should include a testamentary trust in your will, what does that actually mean? Because that has a lot of different meanings from a legal point of view. So estate planning, what does it mean? Well, the dictionary, and I'm not gonna say which dictionary because they were all slightly different, um, talks about it being a, a plan um, to carry out an individual's wishes and the administration and disposable of disposal of his or her property before or after their passing. Now, I wanted to just say hacker's definition, but anyway, it says Anna Hacker's definition. Um, I think our marketing people decided that it was a bit more um, professional to say it in that way. Making sure what ha you want to happen to your stuff happens if you're no longer in control due to incapacity or upon your passing. Pretty similar. Basically though, it's all about making sure that what your client wants to happen is going to happen. And it's really critical to understand that this is not just um, when you've lost, when you've passed away, but also making sure that it's covered during a person's lifetime. And that's really critical. That's something I think that is often forgotten. Because what happens if these things are not in place? If um, a person does not have the appropriate valid documents in place in their lifetime and they lose capacity, <clears throat> and an application needs to be made to the relevant guardianship tribunal in, in whichever state they're in. And this is state-based, so each state is slightly different. In some cases, um, you would say it's an administration order. For guardianship issues, so that's where someone lives, it's a guardianship order. It's, as I said, it's all slightly different depending on the state. Basically, an administrator is very similar to an attorney. There are some really important differences though. Um, some may say that having an administrator is actually more protection for someone because an administrator actually has to provide um, financial reports each year and they're reviewed by a um, government body. So in, in Victoria, it's the state trustees. They look at what the reports are and ensure that everything's being done um, appropriately. If any big um, decisions need to be made as well, the tribunal needs to give its sign off. So let's say you want to um, sell a property and there might be a question as to whether that's in the person's best interests. Um, that's something that the tribunal can look at. Whereas an attorney can actually do these things without having any oversight. People will often come to us and say, but who does um, have oversight over what an attorney does? And look, it kind of depends what support system someone has around them. Again, I think that this is really important because we have had a question in the last um, couple of months from an attorney who came in to sign their documents to say, so when I act as my mum's attorney, who's actually going to be watching what I do? And that's not an unusual question. People say what happens. In this case, though, the person went on to say, so if I wanted to, um, you know, make sure I kept her house, but that's actually not in her best interest, but it is for me because I'm the beneficiary of her will, what do I do? And we have to say, well, to us it's quite obvious you need to act in your mum's best interest, 
But the person said, well, uh, you know, what if I don't want to, though? Well, that person, firstly, is probably not the right of person to be the mum's attorney. But the reality is that it can be difficult to monitor what attorneys do. Administrators, though, generally have all of their actions monitored by the tribunal. Of course, there's always examples where that doesn't happen. But in, in general situations, they are monitored. In testacy, um, if someone does not die, dies without a valid will, then the laws of testacy apply. And that's um, the legislative um, breakdown of how their estate is going to be distributed. Again, each state is different. I have had clients who have said, um, you know what, I actually don't want to put a will in place. I'm fine with the laws of intestacy. I've read them and I know what they are. Unfortunately, they're subject to change, and that's what we've seen um, in a couple of states in the last couple of years, um, and they have changed quite significantly, especially for blended families. I would say that it produces a fairer outcome, but it's not necessarily the outcome that the people wanted. Um, again, it's a reason to make sure you have valid documents in place. And just very quickly, I would point out that it's important not just to have the documents, but the valid documents in place, because someone could have a power of attorney that looks okay on the face of it, but there's some issue with the signing, there's an issue with the dating, there's an issue with the way the conditions are um, placed in there, there's an issue with the language. And for all of those reasons, um, the, the document is actually not valid. So it's important to ensure not just that it's there, it's not enough to just tick off to say, my client has a power of attorney or a will, it's important to make sure they're actually valid. I've also put on here superannuation and I, I put that there because what we're seeing one is that a, a huge number of clients now have self-managed funds. Um, they also have a lot of whether it's self-managed or not a huge amount of their wealth is in super. If they lose capacity and they have an SMSF we need to make sure that they have the appropriate procedures in place in their deed to make sure that who they want to take who they want to take that role of a trustee or a director of a corporate trustee can. If they can't and there's, it's unclear in their trust deed it may mean that while we're trying to work out what to do the fund becomes non-compliant and we know what it difficult situation that is. The other side is that for um, other types of funds, so non-self-managed, your, your APRA um, type funds, it, we need to make sure that the attorney also, um, do they have the power to um, validate a, a new binding death benefit nomination or um, do they not? And there have been a few cases at the Super Complaints Tribunal where an attorney has tried to make a new binding death benefit nomination for the person who's lost capacity and they were not found to be valid, but it wasn't actually a question of could an attorney do this? The problem was more in what they did. So they gave it to someone, the super member balance, death benefit balance, to someone who was actually not a valid um, beneficiary. Um, the, the tribunal didn't really look at, are they as an attorney allowed to do this? So I think it's a really important issue that needs to um, really be looked at in the future. Why is it important to advisors? Well, it assists clients because you want to make sure that their own wealth is um, is preserved and you need to make sure as well that any businesses they have um, have a business succession plan in place. It does ensure that smooth transition to the next generation. And um, on top of that, for the advisors, it can allow that continuity of service with your clients and with their ne that next generation. It builds that trust with them as well. Um, I mean, a lot of you probably are already uh, looking at the estate planning of um, your clients, but I think that once you're involved in that estate planning conversation, so not just sending it off to a lawyer, but actually involved in that multidisciplinary approach where you may even have an advisor, a lawyer, potentially an accountant in the room together, you will see how there's a lot of value added to that client's experience. And I experienced I experience this a lot, but I experienced it just the other day. The, the structure that was in place for the client was exactly what the client had asked for, exactly what the advisor had understood the client's needs were. When we talked about their estate planning, however, it was a different outcome. And because of that, there was a need to increase um, the, the, their insurances and um, we needed to make sure it was also a, a different nomination for um, their insurance and their super. So it was actually structured completely differently after that estate planning conversation. The way that that was um, approached by myself and the advisor, we were able to support what each other was saying. So it was um, 
something that the client saw as, well, I have a team around me helping me. I really trust these people as well for my next generation. And in that case, the advisor um, will be listed as the um, preferred advisor for the estate and the trusts that are set up in the will. And that's because the client could see how it all worked together and they could understand why it wasn't just a case of getting a will and getting a document signed. It was actually making sure that everything was set up properly for that next generation. The biggest question I have is, how do I actually start um, this conversation? Because unfortunately, it's not an easy one to potentially have. Um, people don't really like talking about death. They don't really like talking about what's going to happen after they've passed away. And um, I think that it's something that people put off for a long time. I've said here that you should focus on that next generation. So, you know, a lot of estate planning, even though you set up powers of attorney to ensure the client's looked after in their time and their wishes are fulfilled, you do need to look at um, for the will, what, this is actually putting things in place for that next generation. So focusing on that and the tax advantages of doing a trust in this way or potentially um, focusing on reducing um, you know, the, the risk to access to social security, all of these things are important things to talk about with clients. You need to be direct about it though. So you can't say, look, have you done your will? Um, I, I, I know we talked about it last year. Um, we need to make sure that something is um, in place. Okay, well, well, we'll just forget about it because it's, it's a bit of a tough conversation to have. I can assure you in estate planning conversations with clients, it's really common that, um, well, not really common, but we certainly probably every couple of months have a client crying. And that happened actually this morning um, on, on the phone with a client who was talking about excluding um, children from their will. And it's a really important emotional discussion for people. But there is that um, more procedural side, which is I need to actually put a document in place. I need to talk about the family structure, but I need to actually have something in place. They need to understand that if they haven't done it, there can be really um, disastrous outcomes for their clients um, and for them. So for the clients, for themselves, they need to understand that you might put all of these wonderful things in place in their lifetime. If the will does not um, provide the support around that, it's not going to be effective. Um, those areas of importance can include caring for elderly parents. Um, we are finding that now people are not just thinking about caring for their kids, but they're thinking about caring for their parents who are elderly. You know, they think, well, you're talking about what if we all passed away? That could mean my parents are left and my parents are the beneficiaries, but they're too, um, you know, they, they need care themselves. So how am I going to put something in place to make sure they're looked after? Um, children, you know, obviously that's usually a, a really big key motivator for people. You talk about have you made sure that what's in place in your wills is going to make sure your kids are looked after. It could be because there's a charity that they're involved with. As an advisor, you likely know what these areas of importance are going to be. You need to not just say, you know, here's a one size fits all, I'm just going to um, say the same, um, have the same conversation with every client. If you focus on these areas of importance for the clients, then they are going to see the importance of the estate planning um, process and they're going to understand why they need to do it. Pets, if anyone has a client who um, doesn't have children, has pets or, or maybe has children and pets, you, you'll find that the pets are a real focus of it. And I've certainly seen extremely complicated wills with much more detailed um, processes for how pets are looked after than children um, in, in significant, you know, in, with significant wealth attached as well. So people will do things like set up um, the ways that their pets will be cared for immediately after death. They've passed away. Um, I have even had a will where the process was, there was multiple pets. Um, and it was about, I want to actually be buried with this particular pet. So we had to talk through how that would actually happen because you can't actually be buried with your pets. Um, but that's something that people often talk about. Minimising tax obviously is often a, a way that you can appeal to people, even if they're not um, looking at these other areas. Um, do you really want to pay more tax? Probably not. Do you want your beneficiaries to pay more tax? Probably not. So that's obviously an area that people um, that there's a lot of appeal there. And case studies can be quite useful, I think. Um, I think that the biggest issue we find when we talk with 
clients about getting a new, and this is for lawyers having, this is the difficulty that we have. There's something in place, a client just wants us to make sure it's okay and we find an issue with it. The problem is people, they're always so price sensitive. Um, you think though about what someone pays for their TV, what they pay for their haircuts every year, um, that they would not be willing to put less money into preparing documents that will literally cover how their next generation is going to be handling their um, inheritance. It, you know, I think people need to weigh up, um, you know, these things and look at, well, okay, this is actually really important. And if it goes wrong, the cost is huge. Now, case studies, I have a few here in the presentation that I'll go through. I love talking about case studies. And if anyone ever does want something where they say, I think my client needs to understand why this is really important, I'm more than happy to go through specific ones as well. Maybe not now, um, because we only have an hour, but... The, the case studies are really good for showing, well, this is how it can go wrong. Um, I think that usually when we talk with clients about if this goes wrong and this goes to court, this is going to cost a couple of, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 just if there's an error in the way the will has been prepared. And I've seen that. I, I had a situation once where we had three wills. They were all signed. One was witnessed properly, one was only witnessed by one witness, and the last was only signed by the will maker. None of them were dated. We had to go to court to put all three forward. They all did completely different things. Um, they they dealt with assets that weren't even in the will maker's you know, control, so there was a huge amount of difficulty in administering the estate. But it cost about $20,000 just to go to the court and say, we have approval from all these beneficiaries. There was about 20 beneficiaries that were listed across the three wills. Each one needed to provide consent for how, uh, whether they agreed with the application for that particular will to be accepted. And, you know, that sort of thing, I think, is enough to make sure people get this done properly. I think it's also really important, and I'm sure that you do this in your own conversations about financial advice, you need to just talk about outcomes. It's not just about the documents. You know, when we, we um, look at insurance for our clients, that's important, the document, the policy itself, you know, that's what people come back to. But the outcome of that insurance, what that means, it's not just a figure, it's been calculated because of your needs and your circumstances. It's again, not one size fits all. And so understanding those outcomes, the outcome of this is your kids, they're going to be looked after, they're going to have structures in place that will support them throughout their lives, or um, they're going to, we're going to ensure that this charity is looked after and that they're going to get um, a nest egg that grows over time. Talking about the outcomes is, is really important because, again, if people focus only on the documents, that's when they think, well, I'll just get a will kit and I'll, I'll um, fill that out and it'll be fine. Um, I, I often say that will kits are fine for litigation lawyers because they love them. There's a lot of risk in doing um, will kit wills. Um, lawyers can make a lot of money out of it and beneficiaries are often quite unhappy because they do not get what they think they deserved. And, and I think that people don't really want that outcome for their beneficiaries either. As I've said, estate planning, it's not one size fits all. You know, be wary of just saying to people, I think you need a will with testamentary trusts. It's important, I think, for clients to understand what that is. Why do they need it? You are not... Um, the, the lawyer giving legal advice, but understanding the differences, and we'll go through some of the differences um, in this presentation, Can you can talk about, I think you need a discretionary testamentary trust, or I think you need a capital reserved testamentary trust in your will. Um, I think that that just supports the need to get professional advice as well. You collaborate with lawyers. Um, look, everyone's different. Some people do like to just send their referrals to the lawyers because they trust them and they know they're going to do the right thing. And certainly we have a lot of advisors that we work with um, using that model. Where the advisor is that facilitator or project manager though, I think um, that can really, again, really help the client with their relationship with you. You already have an immense amount of trust with these clients. They trust you, otherwise they wouldn't be following your advice. But if you become that facilitator, then you also, as I said, get access to that next generation. You understand needs that might affect the way you set up the, the, um, the your side of things. And I think that when we all understand where our role ends and starts, that's also really important. So that there's not confusion. 
Um, I, I had a really interesting situation where I presented last week to um, a community group and um, I someone, and this is a really common question that comes from um, from people um, in, in any forum, honestly. So how do I prevent a challenge in my estate? It's really a pretty simple answer um, because you can't unless there's nothing there. So the only way to really prevent a challenge is to ensure there's nothing in your estate when you pass away. If there's something there, someone will, could potentially challenge. They, they won't necessarily, but they can. And um, we certainly see people fighting over small estates. Um, when I talked about, well, you need to make sure there's nothing in your estate, that's what I talked about. I talked about the, the there would be not just that um, you, you might transfer assets out, you might have assets jointly held. The presenter after me and um, was a wonderful presenter talked um, though about products and I don't talk um, specifically about products. And he said, oh, I'd like to say, you know, one of the ways you could prevent a challenge is an investment bond. And I thought, well, that's a really great idea. But as a lawyer, I don't think of those specific products. I might talk about, well, to the client, you need to look at these things. Um, but as a lawyer, I can't give financial advice. And I think our brains are very wired to, we need to be really careful because if we give any financial advice or anything seen to be financial advice, that creates confusion as well for the client. They think, so who's giving me the financial advice? Who's giving me the legal advice here? So I think the same goes the other way around. And I think that that's why it's important to all be in the room together. So that when I say, you need to not have anything in your estate at the time, someone else who is much um, more well-versed in this area can say, and one of the ways you could do that is some sort of an investment bond that can um, prevent your, anything being in your estate and can transfer straight through the beneficiaries you choose. I think that the last point is really important. I think that this is something that um, you know we all, no matter what area, area you deal with, we need to make sure that we keep really, really, really good notes. Um, I think lawyers are pretty good at it. I think financial advisors are pretty good at it. But sometimes you'll have clients that, and, and I'm not sure with financial advisors, generally I think people come to you because they want to say, earn as much money as they want to create this their, their wealth in, in, the, in the best way possible and, and grow it as best they can. The problem sometimes with estate planning is what they want to do in their estate plan is not necessarily the best financial outcome for their beneficiaries. And I have one example um, that I dealt with a long time ago where we were working very closely with an advisor and um, the client had insurances set up and they um, wanted to set up though a life interest in their will. That meant that their spouse received um, the capital, the income, sorry, during her lifetime. When she passed away, the, the capital would go to um, his children from a first marriage. Now, from a, an estate planning legal point of view, that meant that 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 she was only an income beneficiary. She was also um, not the ultimate beneficiary. And for the insurance and the super fund, they looked at that and said, well, that means she is a de tax dependent. They are not. So we're going to tax it um, on their status, not hers. It meant that it was it was taxed. So even though she received the benefit in her lifetime, um, a, quite a huge chunk of tax was taken out um, when he passed away because it wasn't going to a tax dependent because it was going to his kids. Of course, the beneficiary said, so I thought dad's estate was a million dollars or whatever it was. It's, it's about half of that or just a little bit more than half. What did you guys do? Why did you set it up like this? I pretty sure that if you'd done it in a different way, we would have been able to get a much bigger estate. We had written a number of letters to the client saying this was not the best structure for, a t for um, maximising the size of his estate. Um, unfortunately, the advisor did not do the same thing. So there was evidence from our point of view for the, the estate planning documents that we had said that this is not the best outcome for the beneficiaries, but he said, I don't really care because it's this is what I want to do. Because the advisor didn't do it, my understanding is that um, the beneficiaries looked to ways that they could pursue that, that advisor. Um, now, I think that what we'll see is a lot more litigation in this area. And the best way to show that you gave the advice to say, you can do what you want, client, but I'm telling you this is not going to produce the best outcome is to have those notes and make sure that they're up to date and that they're thorough. Because um, when you're in court and you say, well, I think this is probably what I would have done, that's probably not good enough. As a lawyer, we off, uh, lawyers often think, if I was in court, how would this look? How would a judge view what I'm doing? And 
you know, unfortunately, they don't often just believe our word for it, take our word for it. They need something in writing that was contemporaneous with the event. So it's just something to keep in the back of your minds. The first case study I have is the case of Relauer, Corby and um, Littleton. It's from last year. Um, Elizabeth passed away in 2011. She suffered from dementia since 2006. You'll see in that second dot point that probate of her will was granted um, on the 21st of November 2002. Uh, sorry, her will was dated 2002. It was granted to the um, plaintiffs on the two, in 2011. So she passed away in 2011. Probate was granted in 2011. But then this case is from last year. So six years of litigation to get to this outcome. Six years. You will see in the next point that the estate, which was worth only about half a million dollars when she passed away, was reduced to $255,000 by trial. So that included all of the costs being taken out for the parties. It included um, other costs that would have come because the estate had had to continue you know, paying for all sorts of fees and, and costs along the way. So when we say that, you know, the, that the wrong outcome here can cost the estate a lot of money. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, in this case, almost $200,000. Um, in the will, there were various gifts and then the residue, so everything left, went to the trustee for the time being of the Elizabeth Lauer Family Trust. The question the court had to look at was, was the trust validly established? So could it actually be a beneficiary of this estate and of the will? Um, the will had a few other issues, so um, there was a property in it that had been sold, so it said, I give this property to this person, but the property didn't exist, wasn't in her name when she passed away. Those are the issues that happen when people give very, very specific gifts in wills. The, the, the trust, though, had well, allegedly been established um, a number of years before. Um, one of the deceased's friends, George Nagy, had um, assisted her. So um, it's that classic example. He had a friend who had a trust deed and they um, formed it into a Word document. They changed what they think they needed to change. And then they said, presto, we have a family trust established. Unfortunately, there were a number of issues with um, the trust. The trust actually had never really been signed properly. So um, we'll go in some later slides to some, um, some flow charts of how trusts work, but it's really critical that a trust has a set law. Um, this trust had a set law listed, but the, the set law never signed the trust deed. There were also five versions of the trust deed floating around with different signing pages and different schedules. We think what probably happened, and, and the, um, the decision's quite a lengthy one, is that they, they went to um, the bank and they said, we want to open a bank account in the name of this trust. They actually didn't provide the signing clause at all at that point. So the bank has opened a bank account in the name of a trust, but never saw a full trust deed. They went to VCAT. VCAT said, you're missing these pages. They probably went back to the trust deed and actually changed it because they thought they'd done the wrong thing. But then there was another version sitting um, with someone else that was signed in a different way. They then did another version of it and they kept you know, adding different pages and taking pages out. And so in the end, there was five different versions with different beneficiaries in different versions, different people signing them, different signing um, you know, signatures, um, mostly the same date, but none of them had the set law actually signing it. So the decision was, the court said, we have to look at the three certainties of trust creation. Because we're looking at, is there a certainty of intention? The set law never signed any document. A set law is critical to the establishment of a trust. And if anyone um, listening has ever um, established a family trust or assisted um, with the establishment of a trust, you would know that we talk about the set law handing over $10 or $100. In this case, they said that the set law um, establish the trust with $500. The set law has to actually give that money to someone. They can't just say, I've given you $500 and pretend that they did it. You have to prove that that actually happened. And it's not uncommon if you look at old legal files that there's actually a $10 note um, stapled into the file to prove that the $10 was actually handed over. It also cannot come from someone else. It has to come from the set law. So it can't be that the trustee says, hey, neighbor, 
would you be the set law for my family trust, which is actually what happened here, they were neighbours. Um, I'll give you $10 so you can establish my trust. It actually has to come from the, the actual set law. Again, um, that didn't happen. So the court said, well, the set law not only didn't sign the trust, but didn't pay that settled sum. Now the settled sum was $500, so I'm not hugely surprised she didn't pay it because it's a huge amount, but that's why it's only usually about $10. So long as that $10 exists somewhere, that means that trust continues. That was the other problem. There was no certainty of subject matter. It was really unclear what property was actually trust assets. There were bank accounts um, in the name of the trust um, allegedly, but they, they were closed and opened again. There was no confirmation of where the funds had come from. Um, it was really, it was a dog's breakfast. It was There was no certainty of objects either. So there was no clear link between that trust. So the court said, look, even if I wanted to ignore everything else, there's no link between the trust assets. You're saying these are trust assets, but we have no idea where they came from. You didn't say, I'm going to establish this trust and then it's going to be used to hold the money from the proceeds of my sale of home or something. It was all just um, inferences or conjecture from the um, various um, people who were still alive. The other complexity here was that the friend of the deceased had actually passed away himself by the end of the trial. So even the other person who had established it was no longer around to talk about what had happened. And most of the other people, the set laws, and there were two different set laws listed in different trust deeds, um, well, one is or, or also passed away. So what can we actually learn from this? Well, apart from, you know, not having um, some random document signed to make it your trust deed, actually make sure all of those um, formalities are complied with, but um, you need to make sure that those are actually reviewed and that those deficiencies are corrected. If this had been worked out during the person's life, the deceased's lifetime, something could have been done to correct it. Because it wasn't noticed until after she had passed away, there basically wasn't anything that could be done at that point. It was too late. Um, and, you know, just because the bank accepted it as a trust didn't mean it was correct. Just because VCAT never actually explicitly said, this is not a, tr a valid trust, again, doesn't mean that it's a valid trust. Do not rely on the fact that there is a bank account or there is a property in the name of the trust as being saying that the trust itself is valid and that the that it exists. And please never copy and paste another person's documents. Um, it might seem like they're generic, but in this case, um, because they didn't understand those specific tr um, terms within the trust, that's what really caused a lot of the confusion here. So the next case is, I think, really interesting. Um, Ray Damon. Basically, Damon was a um, 51-year-old um, with an acquired brain injury. He had a um, disability support pension. His mother passed away in 2002. Um, her will said, I'm going to leave my estate to um, equally between my four children. Damon was going to, going to receive only the income from, for, from his quarter share, and it wasn't really his quarter share that was the issue. Um, with absolute discretion about the access to the income and capital held by his brother. So his brother was the trustee of his trust and the evidence was that he actually was not receiving all the income. The brother was using his discretion and saying, well, you know what, I know my brother's just going to gamble this away, so I'm not going to give it to him. I'm going to only give him a small amount of that income. This is a really important um, decision and it, it was from um, the AAT, so the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Centrelink had said that um, this was actually a controlled private trust, so all the assets in the trust were attributable to Damon. That meant that he lost his disability support pension, which was not a great outcome for him. It was appealed to the SSAT. They said, we agree with Centrelink, so again, no disability support pension. The AAT said, Look, he's a potential beneficiary, but he doesn't have effective control. His brother is not giving all of the income to him. So even though he is the, the main beneficiary here, he is not receiving everything. He was not in effective control. There was a lot of um, other beneficiaries that were listed. And also we can see that he hasn't received any capital distributions at all. Um, it's important because this is actually an issue that comes to us quite a bit. Who you know, Centrelink is saying this trust that was established um, is um, that the, the assets are meaning that my, my sibling or my child or whoever is not going to get the disability support pension. What can we do to ensure that they can maintain it? And it's not often the pension that's important, it's often other 
things like healthcare card. It's about does that person have control? Can they influence decisions? Can they make sure that they get all the income and capital? Do they have that control? Um, in this case, th there wasn't any evidence he would even get any future significant distributions. So the um, AAT said he doesn't really have that control and that's what you have to look at. If you say it's a discretionary trust, it has to actually be a discretionary trust. Most of you hopefully know or have heard of some of these types of trusts that are up on the screen. Discretionary trusts, we have really important people here and you, I don't want to go over it in too much detail because I'm pretty sure that most people will have a general understanding of how discretionary trusts work. I just wanted to, I guess, go through the differences that you can see so that when you're talking with clients and you say you should get a testament who trust, you can understand how these work. You've got a set law who establishes with an initial contribution. In the case of a will, that's actually the, the testator, the person who's passed away. The appointor then can hire and fire the trustee. When people say um, that test, discretionary testamentary trusts are there, um, we want to have them in place so that our child um, can have their assets protected if there's a relationship breakdown, you kind of have to have a different appointor and trustee. The appointor has all of the power. The trustee can be hired and fired depending on um, what the appointor wants. So the trustee, they do have a lot of decision making power, but the appointor is the one with really the power. If they're not happy with what the trustee does, they get to make that decision to get rid of them. So if the appointor and trustee are that child that has that relationship breakdown, the court is more likely to say, I think that you actually have control. And so we're going to look at this in a different way as to if there's a different appointor and trustee. Capital reserve trusts. This is where the capital itself is not actually held for that initial beneficiary. They only get income and the ultimate beneficiaries, um, and it's that example I talked about before with the insurance and super payout, you have other people who are actually the ultimate beneficiaries and um, they will receive all of the capital at the end. In the end, if you have a trust structured in this way in a will, you need to really make sure that um, it's clear if you want the income beneficiary to get the biggest benefit or the capital beneficiaries. Because generally, if a trust is established and there's capital beneficiaries listed, the idea is that you would maximise capital of that trust. That might increase the income, but it's is it about that long-term protection or is it about ensuring that your income beneficiary is actually benefiting along the way? So you, you probably need to set that out in a will to make sure the right person's getting the biggest benefit. Protective trusts. This is about ensuring that main beneficiary has their needs met. So it's usually someone who has um, a vulnerability. It might be a disability. It might be an addiction. Um, you want to ensure that they're looked after but it's the Damon example. It's the one where people have um, a, a need and you want someone to protect them and make sure that someone can't come along and basically take their, their assets. Special disability trusts. Um, I could do a whole session. I have actually done whole sessions on special disability trusts. Similar to a protective trust, you have um, a beneficiary who's main care needs are needing to be met. The difference is, unlike a protective trust where, as you saw Centrelink said, this is all going to be attributable to that main beneficiary, in a special disability trust, so long as the criteria are met, the um, capital within the trust up to a threshold and um, look, it changes every um, July 1st, so it's just changed and I could not, I looked and looked and looked and I'm sure someone is saying, I already know what it is, but I couldn't see it this morning. Um, as of the, the 30th of June, it was 657,250 in capital um, that could be held in that trust. Um, I'm, it, it would have increased, so it would be a little bit more than that now. So um, there's huge benefits to these for the right beneficiaries, but they have to have a severe disability to even be considered to have one. Charitable trust. Now, this is something for the right client. There's ones in people's lifetime. There's ones that are established as a part of a will. Um, the main reason you'd have them in place is to ensure that the charities are going to receive ongoing support and they go on in perpetuity. So they're going to continue basically forever. The partnership with your with the advisor is really critical so that people do see that there's um, a, a link between what they're talking about for the financial conversation and also the estate planning. Um, I think that it's different to the advice conversation because um, it's it's a focus on 
the, the individual relationships that people have with the wider family. So not to just, just about the client's needs, but about the other people's needs as well. And that's why it can be really important and why you can get that conversation going with the next generation as well. The case studies about elder abuse, I think are really interesting and I am aware that I'm at 45 minutes. So I'll go a little bit longer, um, but not too much. The case studies, are uh, they're, they're really sad to be perfectly honest, but um, I think they're really important for us all to understand. The first one I'm going to go through is Stan Lee, and, and many of you probably are aware of Stan Lee, 95 year old, he's co-creator of um, you know, Marvel comic um, book characters, so Black Panther, um, you know, many, many others. Um, there has been a recent investigation into his um, business manager and advisor. Now, Kaya Morgan, he actually is um, a someone who, um, who who deals with collectibles, and he's apparently a Marilyn Monroe expert, whatever that is. Apparently, I'm sure you don't need to go to university to become an expert in that area, but he is one. He somehow became in. Um, involved with Stan Lee in the last couple of years and after Stan Lee's um, wife passed away in July of last year so just um, under just about 12 months ago he really took over his life so he actually had him move out of his family home and move in with him he has cut off all contact between Stan Lee and his long-term um, solicitor his advisors even his family, so he, he's basically cut off contact and that's a really common thing with elder abuse. You will see that suddenly they're, they're closing in that circle so that people have to rely on them. Um, police actually issued an emergency restraining order against Morgan. Um, this, this literally just happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, they said that as well, Stanley, since his wife passed away, had had people take $300,000 from his bank account, had, had purchased a unit with 850 grand. Basically, Morgan as well had complete control over his life. The, the most disturbing allegation is that um, Morgan had had some, um, some requests for blood to be taken from Stan Lee that was then used to sign autographs on comic books to make money, which I just, is just, honestly, I think criminal charges should be from that. That's, that, that's clearly abuse. But just to show then that the level of dementia here, Stan Lee um, then went on Twitter to say, you know, this guy, Morgan, he, he's um, my only trusted advisor, don't believe anything that anyone else is saying. It's really hard then for the police to say, well, we're trying to help you. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see what happens here. But I think that the main thing is when there's these people that suddenly appear at a time of vulnerability for your clients, that's a warning sign. Make sure that you look out for that because they might seem like they're there to look out for them, but unfortunately they can really um, take over and the main thing they'll do is cut off all the existing relationships that that person has to try and um, put themselves in and make themselves um, the, the, the linchpin for these people's lives. Lillian Betancourt is the last one that I'll talk about now. Um, she has passed away. Um, it says 92 because that's when the case was, um, but she passed away um, last year. She was 94. Her um, her fortune, about uh, an estate of about $40 billion. The um, person that manipulated her is the, the one in the photograph. Um, that is a photographer, Banyer, and he um, received about a billion dollars in gifts um, over, it was a, you know, it was about 20 years overall, but a lot of them were at the end of her life. And um, he was given an island. Um, he was given Picasso paintings. He received just cash. Um, it was a really, if you ever want to see a really in, sad but interesting case of um, elder abuse that played out with someone who you would think would have all the support around them to have this not happen. <clears throat> this was such an interesting um, case study. Um, a lot of the times Lillian, she, uh, her, her staff around her could see that she was being manipulated but nothing, no one felt that they could do anything. So the staff actually, um, once they really were concerned, actually started recording the discussions that she was having between herself, this man, her lawyer, her wealth manager. Now, the reason I have this here as an example and in this particular um, webinar, it's really, I think, a bit scary to, to see, but her wealth manager 
um, and, and a lot of the um, conversations included the wealth manager where he was basically saying, you want to do this, and she didn't know what was going on, and he still had her signed documents. He actually received an 18-month jail um, term and fines for his role in this. So I think this is something where it was probably over time just getting worse and worse and people thought, I'm sure I'm just helping her. There was a point where clearly you were not, clearly it was just all in someone else's interests. And um, Banya himself actually had three years in prison and um, was fined um, 418,000 um, euro, but uh, had to pay back 158 million um, euro as well. So practical solutions, make sure everything's in place early. Look, they were in this case, but it's also making sure those, those, those tough conversations are had. Is that the right person? Should it really be your nephew? Should it be someone independent? Consider what to do if you have that, um, that play out. And I think it's basically not thinking that it's not an issue. I think the important most important thing is to actually recognise that this could actually happen to anyone. And it might not be when they're 80 or 90, it could be when they're 60. Have a checklist as well if there's an issue of capacity. What we do um, from a legal point of view is if we think there's an issue of capacity, we'll say to clients, um, look, we have a checklist. If we tick two, we ask for a medical certificate. It means no one feels embarrassed that we're saying you, we don't think you have capacity. It's a really objective checklist. If they're not working full time and they're over a certain age, which you know most people will, will probably not be able to um, tick if they're of a certain um, generation, and, and that um, often can mean that there's not that uncomfortable conversation where you have to say, I think you don't have capacity because you can't really have that conversation with someone. You talk about the integrity of what you're doing and wanting to ensure that what you're putting in place will actually be um, followed through and that someone is not going to take advantage of them. So that's the end. Thank you, Anna. Really good presentation there. Listeners, we hope you found that valuable. And um, yeah, you see the importance of having these conversations about estate planning with your clients, no matter how uncomfortable it may be. Um, so we'll move on to a couple of questions now. Um, I've got one here from Mark. Mm -hmm. um, he says he sometimes finds clients come to him with, or they already have an established yeah. estate plan in place, but often uh, there's some holes in them or yep. there's some errors in place. Yep. How would you approach that conversation to say, hey, you need perhaps a better one or mm. I've got a, another um, lawyer or solicitor you should use? Yeah, that, that's actually really an awkward conversation, isn't it? Because one, you don't, if they trusted that lawyer to do um, the documents in the first place, look, if, if they did the documents themselves, I think you can just say, look, I think we need to revisit this because it, uh, any estate planning documents, um, they're really important. We need to get professional advice. And given you know there's been maybe changes since you put this in place, it's a good idea to um, have them revisited. In a lot of cases, and I think that this is where you have a good relationship with an estate planning lawyer, um, look, for us, we will often say, look, if you need to get someone over the line, we're happy to um, have a quick look to give you some ideas about what specifically might be an issue. Um, and that way, they, there's a, it's a bit more of a robust conversation. So if you, as an advisor, though, can already see there's issues, I think you probably need to say, look, I know someone who is a specialist in this area. This is all they do. Let's just uh, see if we can um, have that conversation. Um, I think that it's about understanding what will go wrong. So let's say the issue is that it's signed incorrectly, it will just fail. It's it's not even an issue of um, how can we correct this later. It will fail, it will cause the estate to have a lot of expense, um, especially the court fees. And I think that in that way that can be easy. Understanding what those outcomes can be though is probably the way to get the clients over the line because often they think this is, look, I can get it from the post office. Why does it? Why do I need to see someone about it? it? It's the same as the conversations you have about how valuable what your advice is. It, it's just an extension of that. Yeah, hope that answers your question, Mark. Um, I've got another one here from Chris, who's asking, um, what determines which state's laws apply? Um, is it so where they live or where the will was drafted? That's a really interesting one. So it's kind of going to depend on what the asset is. In general um, terms, there's the domicile of the, the will maker so, and the person who passed away. So if they passed away um, 
in Victoria. Um, generally, it would be you can get probate of a will in Victoria. Where the will itself was made is generally not the um, determiner of where probate is granted itself and which laws of administration apply. But in some cases, other states can actually, and especially if there's what's called an immovable, this is getting really technical, I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. an immovable. So there's a, a movable, so something like a bank account, something like um, something that can be it's not attached to land or physically attached to a state, that it can be administered in any estate, any state, sorry. The movable though is generally going to have to be dealt with in that state. That doesn't mean you can't get probate in another state and it's quite common that here, um, you know, we might administer an estate of someone who's passed away in Victoria and then they might have assets in New South Wales, assets in WA, and then we have to deal with those states and potentially get a reseal of that probate. So it, it kind of depends on what you're dealing with. Generally, the where the domicile of the person who passed away is, is where probate is initially granted, but sometimes it will depend on on what connections they had with the state. It's not a, a black and white sort of an answer, but um, generally it would be where the client was domiciled. Yeah. Go on. Lived where they lived. Go on. <laughs> um, got an interesting one here um, about elder abuse. Yep. Um, what, I guess, initiatives should someone take if you suspect your client mm. is perhaps showing signs of abusing their elders? So maybe have a child and then you see signs that they're trying to extract money from their parents. All right. So your client's the dodgy one. Yes. Um, that's really interesting because I think that if it was, you know, you probably understood from what I've said that if your client is the one being abused, I think you have a bit of an obligation to make sure your client's looked after. But if your client is doing the, the, the wrong thing, I think that there are ways that you can get advice about what to do because each situation will be um, individual. There will be the public advocates in various states or even those guardianship tribunals can provide support. There are um, also senior rights and they often, um, those organisations might be state-based and, and actually looking into what can be done. The difficulty is there may be um, a difficulty in you doing anything. Let's say in Victoria, and I apologise for all those interstaters, you must be sick of me saying in Victoria, but in Victoria, anyone can apply to VCAT to have um, a, an administration order issued about somebody. Of course, it, if you did that, you would lose your client, whether that's a good or a bad thing, given those circumstances, I'm not sure, but um, there's there's some things you can do to at least investigate it and whether there if you have a concern my suggestion is there's probably other people that would be concerned about that scenario too and so it may be at least you, you're not breaching confidentiality by going out and talking but at least maybe you can can make people feel like you know what I thought I, I was concerned about my aunt's situation um, you yeah, there, there might be some way there. But I suggest talking with um, people who deal with these things, you know, day in, day out at those senior rights organisations, and they can probably give better tips because um, it, it is a, it is going to be a very difficult situation to try and deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I should say, if you think there's something criminal going on, though, I would suggest you probably can actually do something so uh, you know the, again those those rights organizations are good but you know in a worst case in, in a worst case type of situation the police can get involved yeah and um, a question here from Neil um, if a client has no relatives no kids no spouse basically no yeah. one they can lean upon mm -hmm. um, I guess what is your preference on to um, how to ensure the will is acted upon as, as instructed so if there's no one that's actually kind of had, I guess it depends on who the beneficiaries are. It's always a good idea if there's no one um, that is, you know, no kids and no, no real next of kin to ensure that you have someone who is appropriately um, able to act as an independent executor. Um, you know, that's that's what we do. We're um, a trustee company, so there are various trustee companies around, but places like Australian Unity Trustees can um, step in and, you know, this is what we do day in, day out. So a trustee company, that's their bread and butter, assisting people who may have lost capacity during their lifetimes um, and administering estates. And, and, you know, we know how to do it. So I think that that's usually the best way. Um, 
obviously people talk as well about you know friends more distant people um, but I think that having that that level of independence is really important because as well you can make sure that there's a lot of protections in place trustee companies are quite regulated um, obviously clients need to look at what the fees are associated with administering their estate in by trustee companies but what you will find is that when it's done efficiently the the benefit outweighs that cost because it's administered in a really efficient quick professional way um, and it's not sitting there you know eight years later still not being administered so so that's one way great and um, question from Jeff how do you see advisors charging for facilitating estate planning advice in a multidisciplinary approach. Yep. Um, we have all sorts of different um, ways that we've seen advisors um, charging. So um, we have advisors where they might have it as a part of their, their broader annual fees that they're charging for clients. So they might add on a, a por an amount. It could, it, it's a big range. So um, honestly, I've seen people who have charged about um, I probably shouldn't even say, but you know, about two thousand dollars for doing basically all of the fact finding. So the client does nothing; they don't have to do that usual fact finding and getting the trustees and getting everything. And so they're really a project manager, and they're doing a lot of work in relation to the estate plan, making sure that everything's um, put in place. Then others that um, might say, "Look, I'm, I, I charge a, a, a flat fee of you know four hundred dollars for um, a, I attend the meetings. I make sure that what I have in place is appropriate." in consideration of what you're doing with estate planning. And in some cases we send our fees, and, and look, this is, you, you need to work out, I guess, what the lawyer that you're working with um, is happy to do, but we often send um, our account to the advisor so it's bundled up together. It's clear what our fee is and what the advisor's fee is, but the client only has one fee. And I think that um, can, can help the client as well understand what it is. One thing I had recently, which I th thought worked so well, was, um, and we have it a bit, but it just works so efficiently, was an advisor a year ago had said to their client, have you got, you know, get your estate planning done. This year when they organised their annual um, review, the client still hadn't done it. So she said, Look, you come, we'll have our annual review, and then I'm going to invite an estate planning lawyer along, and we're going to all sit down together and talk about this. Now, um, the, the charging would be it, a part of her annual review fee anyway. The, the time it took wasn't that much more because the um, you know the documents were already there. Um, but for her, the ability to interact with her clients in that way was honestly um, just you, you you can't really put put a price on the value for for her I think and her business. So that's a really good way I think. And, and the cost for the client would for the advisor directly would not have been that much um, and then our fees can be bundled up with what she's charging clearly obviously isolating what ours and the advisor's fees are though thank you Anna um, unfortunately we've run out of time <laughs> um, sorry to everyone who has um, so many questions and we just didn't get a chance to uh, get to those ones but I just want to thank you again for joining us thank you Anna for joining us yeah, no problem. we hope you enjoyed it found found it valuable and a reminder that we will be sending an email out within a week that will include a link to the recording of the session, the slides um, that Anna presented today, as well as a link to uh, the CPD survey to complete your, to uh, receive your CPD certificate. So thank you all again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next month for our next webinar. We hope you have a great day. Thank you.